<laughs> well, uh, I, um, this is the kind of piece of scripture that just drifts right by it. You know, you're like God, Nathan, David, chatting back and forth. And it's one of those ones that's not filled with a lot of punchy language or anything. It's really like, you know, kind of seems ho-hum. But I have to uh, remind you that Second Samuel chapter 7 is like the pivot point of the whole David story in many ways. The whole, the whole story of First and Second Samuel pivots on this point, but also God's relationship with, with humankind and with the faithful pivots right on this point. Did you catch it? No, it was kind of whole hum. Well, let me tell you about it. David is, uh, has, he's danced. You know, we've preached and spoken about David whirling and dancing in front of the Ark of the Covenant and bringing it into uh, Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant is where the Ten Commandments live. I've got a picture of it there up on the uh, left. That's what they think the Ark of the Covenant looked like. I don't know if it looked like that in Indiana Jones movie or not, but uh, remember Raiders of the Lost Ark? It was all about the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant held the Torah, the teachings, the Ten Commandments, uh, the Decalogue in, in them, and, and they were carried from place to place, wherever the Israelites were, all through the wilderness, after Sinai, and in tents, and this kind of thing. And David thinks, aha, if I really want to centralize my power, I will bring the Ark to Jerusalem. So he does that with great dancing and whatnot. He gets trouble in trouble with his wife, Michael. But then he thinks, what am I doing? I'm living in a really nice house. i got a nice palace. God is out there living in a tent still. I'll further consolidate my power by building a temple for God. Every ruler that the world has ever known that has wanted power knows a temple. And bringing your God to roost on that temple right next door to your palace, very handy, is a way to help legitimize your power. Although David was wise in his use of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark as a symbol and the temple are actually at odds. The Ark symbolized the freedom and mobility and the unpredictability of a God of the wilderness people of Israel. A God who would go where the people were. The temple was all about an attempt to soften and possibly control this dangerous, more mysterious elements of God's character. Put God in a temple, build God a house for God, possibly control God, shape God, hold on to God, cling to God. That's the temple. And that wasn't the God of the Ark of the Covenant. There's a tension all the way through the history of the Israelite people. The God of Sinai, a wilderness God, a wilderness mountain God, who travels with the people, and the God of Zion, that's the mountain of Jerusalem. The God who is in one place and the God who is everywhere. And you'll remember, just as an aside, you'll remember the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well. And the woman is a Samaritan woman and she says, our, our, your, you worship your God in a temple in one place and our God is the God of the wilderness. That's Sinai and Zion intention anyway. That's the regular station program. This story probably expresses that real theological tension in Israel. Is God free or is God present in one place? Is God free and everywhere or is God present in one place? Or are they mutually exclusive? Well, God, through Nathan, the prophet, this is Nathan's first appearance, it's a good one, through an oracle to Nathan and then Nathan to David rejects David's plan outright. Nathan says, go and do what you plan because God is with you. And then God says, no, I'm not. Right? So like immediately, Nathan says, God is with you. And then God wakes Nathan up in the middle of the night and says, no. No, I'm with David, but he is not putting me in a temple. I didn't ask for it. And this is beautiful. This is beautiful speech from God. God says this. Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I've not lived in a house since the day I brought the, up the people out of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I've moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd the people, saying, Why have you not built me a house out of cedar? No. Not once have I asked for anybody to build me a house, God says. God will not be held 
in a place by religious arrangement. God wishes to remain a God of coming and going. David wishes to build a plush home of cedar, but such plushness offends God's self-understanding. God is a bit wild around the edges. God is a smoky pillar or a pillar of fire on the valley's rim. God is not a God hidden in an ark in a temple. God will not be bought off, Walter Bergerman says to us. God will not be bought off, controlled, or domesticated by such luxury. Almost to prove God's uncontrollable, unpredictable nature, God jumps way ahead of what David wanted. David wanted some legitimacy for his kingship. He wanted the people to know, I am the king of all the Israel, first unified king they had, of all of Israel, the north and the south. I am the king of Israel, and we are going to be a Zion people, because God is going to live right next to me here on Mount Zion. That's what David wanted, legitimacy for his own kingship. God leaps way ahead and says, forget this David stuff. I am going to bless his whole ancestry. So God starts talking about not living in a temple or a house that David wants, but about building a bigger house, a dynasty for David. And he makes promises about David's offspring, his son to come, that's Solomon. And he makes promises about God, David's lineage forever. God, instead of speaking or agreeing to this one simple little idea of, of uh, David wanting to control God and place him in a house and a temple for his purposes, he speaks of God's purposes. This is a God of promises, a God of the future, a God of abundance. But the abundance goes even further than promises like, I'll make all of your descendants kings of Israel. The promises get even bigger and bigger and here's where all of the theology shifts for us in the Hebrew Scriptures. Verse 15. You got to memorize? No. You will now. Verse 15 starts with an extremely important word. But. But, God says. Previously, God has had a relationship with the Israelites filled with ifs. I will be your God if you behave. I will be your God if you know, perform these circum certain types of uh, uh, sacrifices. I will walk with you forever if you are this kind of nation. Now the language changes to but. And Walter Brueggemann, who I heard preach a couple years ago in Denver, he's the, the king of the Old Testament scripture lessons and teachings for guys like me. Brueggemann always changes his tone. He talks about the God of ifs and the God of punishment, and then he goes, but, he's from Georgia, but, and then he softens his tone. I will love you forever, and I will be your God, blah, blah, blah. Here's the but. It's actually better translated as nevertheless. Nevertheless, God says. Let me find it on my page, because I don't have it memorized. I'm going after this. Nevertheless, I will not take my steadfast love from him. This is Solomon. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from Saul. We all know that story. Whom I put away before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Throne, your throne shall be established forever. This is the language of a steadfast God. Not a conditional God. This is a language shift from ifs to nevertheless. God says, oh sure, I will punish your descendants. If they do wrong things, I will guide them and uh, you know punish them and cajole them and goad them and prod them. Nevertheless, I will never remove myself from their presence. I will never stop being their God. This is the first step. This is the first announcement of God's unconditional love in all of the theology of our ancestors of faith. This is the beginning of God's steadfast covenant that is not related to how we behave. Wow. And you just drifted right through it while Rita was reading. Right? 
It's like putting your car in park. Scripture gets read. You missed it. But let's not miss it. God says, David, I don't want a house. I am a wild, free, crazy God. And by the way, I'm going to explain that to you because you thought I was a God of ifs. No, I am a God of neverthelesses. I am a God who will love abundantly and, for the first time, forever. My love will be sure forever. Well, that got me thinking about how hard it is for us to believe that's true. I'm up here almost every week telling you about God's steadfast, nevertheless, always, forever, agape, unconditional love. Right? And do you believe me? Hardly ever. It's hard for us. It's hard for us to let it sink in. It's hard for us to look in the mirror and think, God loves me no matter what. God will be with me forever. So I got thinking about the houses that we build for God like David wanted to build. This is what we call an extended metaphor. We've built a lot of houses for our God. And most of them, I have to say, like David's, restrain God. First, there's the house of Santa. I love that one kid said God might live at the North Pole because I was thinking about Santa already. You know what Santa is when you mix up the letters. Anyway, house for Santa, making a list. That's a house where God is making a list of who's good or bad, checking it twice, find out who's naughty or nice. Right? How many of us still cling to this image of a Santa God who is actually weighing out all the good things Brian's done, all the bad things Brian's done, right? Which one's heavier, right? That God's making a list and checking it twice. No, 1 Corinthians 13. It's famous. We read it at every wedding. Love does not make, perfect love does not make an account of wrongdoing. Perfect love does not make a list of wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It's right there, 1 Corinthians 13. God's not making a list. Perfect love does not make a list of wrongdoings. Or how, how about the house for Zeus that we built for our God? Oh my goodness, do we ever think our God looks like Zeus? With the chessboard, right? Remember all the movies, Clash of the Titans, all that kind of stuff we watch? And God, you know, so Zeus and the gods of Olympus moving people around, right? Or, or Zeus, you know, just on any whim goes down and messes with human beings. We have the sneaky belief that our God, the God of abundant love, is messing with us. It's really great when we say, oh, you know, God really meant for Reverend Deb and I to be together. Right? That sounds really nice. That's really beautiful. I kind of like the God of chessboard put Deb and I together, right? That sounds beautiful until a kid is hit by a train. God is not moving us around like a game of Pac-Man, like Zeus. That's another house that's troublesome. Or a house for the warrior God we've built. The one who will crush all our enemies. You know, the Girgashites and the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Canaanites. Or the Iraqis or the North Koreans. Right? Oh, our God's going to get them. That's the warrior God house. Don't like that one. Or how about the house that we built for the petty childish God whose feelings are easily hurt. That somehow we've been taught by our Presbyterian or our Methodist grandmothers or our Catholic grandmothers. Don't be angry with God. Don't you say a mean word towards God. Don't be sad. Don't be grumpy. Don't yell at God like Lieutenant Dan on top of the crow's nest. Right? In Forrest Gump. Remember? Lieutenant Dan made peace with his God that night. Come on! Lieutenant Dan says, bring it! We're, man, we're not supposed to be like that to God because God is childish and petty and God can get hurt. And God will run away from us for good if we get wrong. Wrong. Oh, I just sound like Trump. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Some of you may have seen the cartoon that was wandering around this week of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor. And there's Trump down there going, Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Blessed are the meek. Wrong. Oops. God is not living in a house. The house of the petty childish God who will take its ball and run home and stay away from us forever. All of these, if you think about them, are houses of our own self-image. It's like we've placed God inside a house that's filled with portraits of us. So that when God looks to figure out what God should look like, it looks just like 
us petty or judging or childish or manipulative or whatever all our little ways are. God does not have the emotional life of human beings. Now I know that we love to think of God, the hands of God stretching out or the eyes of God watching us, and that helps us feel closer to God. But somehow in those images, it can also make us scared of God. So if we, if we imagine God kind of human-like, it can be very caring. God loves us. God cares for us. God holds us, right? That, that's stuff I use every, every week. But the flip side of that is the other human characteristics we've put onto God that are not so great and actually quite restricted and very much like shoving God in a box and then placing God in a temple of our own design. What if we open the door? What if we imagined this week what our houses for God look like that we've built and we threw the doors open and we broke the windows so that God could get out? Okay, the good news is God is already out. Okay, but what if we imagined we opened up our hearts, the houses that we built, and we, we freed up our image of God? What if we knocked them down and imagined a free God not of our own making? Now, this is where I find it's important to breathe. So let's just take a second. Breathe in with me, will you? Whenever we yank images of God out from underneath us, ones that we've clung to, it's really important to breathe. Let's do it again. I did that this morning, and I thought, boy, that kind of feels like God in my life, breathing. Breathe, pause, pause, breathe, love. I read that this week. Pause, breathe, love. Right there, the God of freedom, the wilderness God, the mysterious God, enters right into our bodies with just a breath of air when we pause, when we give up the clinging, when we let our house of cards fall down and God goes a-wandering. Can you imagine a wandering God, a God of the forest and field, a God of the mountain, a God of the moon and the sun, a God who is not exactly what we thought, a God who can't be penned up in a house or a temple because love can't be contained like that. Love has to be free. Love has to wander. Love has to be unpredictable and mysterious and kind of crazy, a little bit chaotic, but extra, extra wondrous when we let it go. May it be so. Amen.